Dominic Mizzurandino, CEO of Retail Wire. You can see me outside later. Now that everyone's here today, we will have a presentation on how AI companies will win the delivery business. And then Skynet will take over the world. Fred Cook, co-founder and CTO, will explain it all. Come on down. Everyone, give a round of applause that he'll never hear. Now do this so he sees it. Yay! Fred Cook, go for it, man. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dominic, for the introduction. My name is Fred Cook. Uh, I am the co-founder and CTO of a company called Viho. And yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about AI today in the delivery business. Uh, so to start, uh, the, the purpose of the talk here is to uh, talk a bit about how AI is reshaping logistics uh, to make uh, package delivery specifically faster, uh, lower defect, and, and more personalized. And um, what I'll share here are uh, just things that, that we're observing in the market. We're a participant in this. Uh, we keep a close eye on, on what other folks are doing in the market. Um, so we'll share areas where companies are utilizing data and AI uh, to power flexible operating models and deliver cost and quality. So first thing is that uh, AI is a thing. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of buzz in this in the last three years or so. It's changed uh, the venture market, the stock market a lot. Um, but hopefully, um, you know, a, a takeaway here is that this is, it's, you know, this is not a flash in the pan. Um, it's not clear like how long it might take to totally transform the industry, but everybody in the industry is doing something in, in the realm of AI, uh, and we're going to talk about a few of those things. Uh, I'll talk about uh, UPS and FedEx are definitely experimenting in this area, and we'll touch on a few areas that, ha that that's happening. Uh, importantly, tech companies with flexible operating models uh, have more opportunities than uh, than the incumbents do to leverage AI in operations. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about what Viho is doing there and what we're seeing some of the other tech companies in our space are doing. And so the goal in general is is to uh, just explain, give give the audience here a better sense of what we think AI is truly capable of and, and, and what it might uh, do over the next couple of years in the industry. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about Viho so that you have some context on, on our business and, and what we're working on, and then we'll get into uh, you know, AI broadly across the industry and then AI within Viho. So uh, Viho is a tech company we started in 2016, uh, I'd, I'd say hyper growth since about 2020. Uh, we got, I'd say, strong product market fit in 2019, 2020, the pandemic and uh, the explosion in demand. Um, and, and capital availability in the industry uh, gave us and, and a bunch of other companies in the deliver, delivery space um, a start during that period. Today, we are, uh, we, we believe at least we're the fifth largest parcel company uh, in, in the United States uh, by, by revenue or package volume. And the main folks that we compete against are uh, the top players in the space. So um, we're you know, regularly on deals against FedEx, UPS, OnTrack, Postal Service, their workshare competitors. And you see on the bottom here, uh, there's a number of uh, flagship brands that um, it's extremely humbling to work with, um, but we mainly serve uh, enterprise clients and we do e-commerce home delivery. By the numbers, uh, more than 99% on, on time delivery, that's across the entire network, including middle mile delays and uh, access issues and everything else. Uh, 4.9 out of five star customer satisfaction. Last year, uh, grew about our client base grew about 288%. So we're uh, definitely a, a fast growing company. Uh, about 67,000 driver partners, and I'll talk about our driver model and, and why, what that number means in a minute here. Uh, 44 markets and counting. And you can see where we are here. We have a strong presence on the East Coast, uh, Midwest, Texas. Uh, and, and are working on getting more density within those regions and, uh, and working on our, our West Coast expansion as well. Three things that make Viho different from the folks that we compete against. The first is a customer experience focus. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that. The second is a flexible operating model. And the flexible operating model uh, is really requires us to be a tech company from the ground up. And I'll, I'll get into a bit of detail on that, and that'll segue us into the AI talk. So a, a, an insight that my, uh, my co-founder and I had when we started was 
that the, the way of thinking, certainly in, in 2018, we got started was that shipping is a commodity and the customer experience didn't matter. And so if you were running logistics for an e-commerce company, you know, you might be able to leverage FedEx against UPS and see who's cheapest and whoever wins the cheapest, you switch to that carrier and your customers probably don't see any difference whatsoever in their the quality of the experience, the delivery experience that they have. And we, we didn't believe that. Uh, what we believed was that shipping and delivery uh, can be an extension of the brand. And I think we observed, you know, like all of you have, what Amazon has done over the last couple of decades in the space here, and the integration between the delivery experience and, and the brand experience and, and the merging of those things. And we said that we believe that we can build a customer-centric product that by creating a great customer experience will lead to better outcomes for the brands that we work with. And that will correlate to savings and that will correlate to brand loyalty and a host of things that a lot of other people at an e-commerce company think about all the time, but the logistics manager historically has not. And as we launch with uh, you know, uh, each of our customers, we work with them to do a case study. We really want to prove to them that you know, while we're, you know, we're winning a bid and we're, probably, you know, we're certainly going to be price competitive on just the delivery services, there are a bunch of other things. The, the primary KPIs of that e-commerce company's business that the, you know, the, the, the COO and the CEO care about or the head of marketing or the head of e-commerce we want to know what that number is, and we want to demonstrate that we can move the needle on that number. And that number is different for different e-commerce companies. And here's a, a you know four, four different companies, some all large companies. Several, I think these are all public companies. Um, and this is one of the top line metrics that they might talk about in their earnings calls. And as we did a, an A/B test and launched in a few markets with them and, and ran a case study, we saw that you know we increased customer lifetime value for a subscription meal kit company. We increased the repurchase rate for a public apparel company. We reduced the total refunds for an, an organic food delivery company, and then an increase in net promoter score for a luxury eyewear retailer. And I'll give one example uh, of, of a feature that we built that is purely customer centric, um, probably adds a little bit of cost on our side, but really drives that customer experience. And this is perfect placement. Uh, customers can go on the App Store, the iPhone or Android App Store, and download the Vho mobile app and uh, uh, validate against a, a phone number on there and, and see all of their orders. And as part of that, uh, there's a feature that it's called perfect placement. And what they can do, what a customer can do, is hit this button and take a photo. Um, sorry, there's an animation I'm missing here. But w when they hit that button, it brings up the camera on their phone, and they can take a photo of exactly where they want the, the parcel to be left. So if they say, I want it you know, in, in this box on my porch, or I want it hidden behind a post on my porch, or I want it in a specific place uh, in, in my apartment complex or in, in the leasing office, they can take that photo. We also take a geotag of where that photo is. And then that photo is shown to the driver, our driver, when they are using our app to do deliveries. And the thing that we found is that results in a 77% decrease in missed deliveries and essentially the delivered not received metric that we look at. And that is an astounding number. That is, there's, I mean, this is the biggest impact that we've had on this number, you know, through looking at all the other features we could use with geocoding vendors and all kinds of things. This had an astounding impact. And one of the secrets of that number is that most people don't use this feature. Only a, a very, very small percentage of our customers actually use this feature. But when you order something from you know, one, one of the brands that I had on the bottom of the screen here and you don't receive it, you care a great deal about that outcome, right? You are extremely motivated to figure out what you're gonna have to do so that the next time you order from that brand, you get that package in your hands when you want it, where you want it. And so those customers are motivated to download the mobile app, to take the photo, and from that point forward, our drivers know precisely where to leave the photo, where to leave the package, both from a geocode standpoint and so it looks exactly like the picture that they took in the app. I promise I'm coming around to AI in a moment. Uh, Tucker Nuck uh, is, is one of our clients that uh, put together um, a, a great testimonial for us here. They say they're aware of their customer expectations are shifting, and Vho is the best option in the market to provide that unparalleled experience. The second differentiator that I talk about is our flexible operating model. So 
what this chart is, this is the last three weeks. I pulled this slide from our business uh, intelligence analytics platform at the beginning of this week. And this is the number of driver routes in one of our markets by day. And so you can see uh, it's, it's pretty spiky, right? On, uh, on our, our peak day of the week, we had 377 routes. The next day, we have 121 routes, 122 routes, uh, 99 routes, 56 routes, et cetera. Uh, a big thing driving this is that we, as, as one of our initial markets that we did really well in uh, was uh, prepared meal, meal kit delivery, um, food delivery, that type of market. And so, you know, as if you have a family and you subscribe to one of these businesses, you probably want your meals on Sunday or Monday, right? That's when most people do their grocery shopping. And so consequently, in, in this market, uh, we still have this these huge spikes where we have all this volume on one day of the week and not on the rest. So from the very beginning of our business, you know, we had to figure out a way to operationalize this. Now, if you need a fleet of brown trucks to try to match this, that's not going to work very well, right? That's going to be extremely expensive. If you, if you have to get a delivery van and have a delivery driver, ideally, just for the sake of employing that driver, somebody employs that driver, they want to work five days a week at least and get a normal amount of routes, your van, you want to be highly utilized. You can't rent a van and use it one day a week. And so... Uh, so the traditional model that that most of the companies in the industry use wouldn't work with this. And so uh, what we did is we use a gig economy model. So we recruit drivers the same way that Uber or DoorDash or those type of companies, Amazon Flex, um, do. And using that model, we're able to very easily get 377 drivers to come in on a Monday uh, and then only 121 the next day. And those drivers work on other platforms the other days of the week. And they work uh, on with Viho on, on those Mondays, and uh, and importantly, this is a profitable market for us. This is we this this works right. It's we win a lot of volume with clients. We're price competitive with clients on this. Our company makes money on this. This is a win for everybody. The drivers have flexibility. Uh, they can opt into this or not. They can work with us or churn and go to another platform if they want to. So this is a win-win-win situation for everybody. Uh, in a scenario that most other delivery companies would not be able to accommodate or certainly be able to operate profitably. Now, the only thing that makes this happen, again, is is the gig economy model. And so if you just follow the path of like, what does that take? What that means is that of these 377 routes, that's 377 drivers where it might be their first time ever, ever doing a parcel delivery. And our commitment to our clients, that 99% plus, which includes middle mile and everything, which means you know, that there's only like a handful of packages out of 1,000 that we can sort of tolerably allow to not make it into the customer's hands at the end of the day, that has to happen for someone, for, you know, someone that has never done parcel delivery ever before in their life. They've never been in that neighborhood. They've never driven through that apartment complex. They, you know, it's their first time ever doing it. That's kind of a crazy thing, right? The way you accomplish that is with technology, right? You need a mobile app that has a huge amount of data uh, that can provide can be provided to those drivers to make sure that they are first sent to the right place, they're at the right doorstep, that's verified, and then second, that they're given the preferences of the customer and that they're they're following through on what the customer's expectation is to be able to do that. And so, just just to kind of run run through this again. Um, Viho, I think path dependence in business is a really is a really big deal, and you can look at a lot of successful businesses and say they sort of ended up where they were because of a set of decisions that that you know that were made along the way. And so for Viho, we started with a very uneven demand curve uh, and speed required. We were not able to like hold those meal kit packages to the next day if we couldn't get them out on time. They had to go out that day. That required us to create a flexible supply model that required a lot of technology at every step in the process to be successful with that, that requires a ton of data and it also enables a large number of technical levers. And I'm using our company, Viho, uh, as, as the example here, obviously, uh, as, as I'm familiar with it, but there, there are, are several tech companies that we have seen um, that, that run through this model. And I'd say on top of that, you know, we see Amazon, DoorDash, uh, Uber through their Uber Eats platform. There are a number of companies 
uh, that um, utilize that model also. Are you guys getting music through your headphones? Oh, got it, okay. Um, contrast this to legacy carriers. Legacy carriers have uh, start, started, you know, path dependence again, um, started with a flatter demand curve. So, B, you know, UPS and FedEx both started with business to business deliveries. So flat across the week, generally not not required to get there one day, could, could wait a day potentially. Uh, a static supply model. So you have a driver in a truck doing deliveries eight or 10 hours a day, five days a week. Very little tech required. These companies grew up sort of before the latest technology revolution and so uh, did not you know, the, the driver knows the neighborhood, they're doing it every day. All of the knowledge that we have to put into an app is sort of in their head and, and is this tribal knowledge that they have. And so again, there's, there's a lack of data required to make their business model work. They don't need to be great at this. Uh, and so fewer technical levers. I'm only interjecting to say I apologize. I was playing my music demo to see if anyone wanted me to audition. We're good now. The music's gone. You're all set. Thank you very much, David. So moving uh, to AI, so a, a, a couple of bullet points here just to talk about things that we're observing in, in AI generally. The first is um, AI versus machine learning. I think uh, I, I'm going to be using these terms interchangeably. I think the important thing to understand is you know, AI and machine learning are generally the same thing. Uh, it's the same set of technology. What, what sort of, I think, a layman would consider AI um, is the large language models that we're seeing from ChatGPT and, and folks today. Um, those are just much, much larger. They might be you know, billions or tens of billions of parameters. It's, it's all just matrix math. Um, size and, and cost matter, though. So uh, you know, if you think about a logistics business, you know, it, it, we, we are not going to be using the same a uh, large language model that you know you would go and ask about like the history of the Roman Empire and could tell you about that to do things like assign a price to a route or get a driver to the right doorstep it that would be a very expensive way to do you know run 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 that millions of times um so so you know we try to get that down to a specialized model um training and inference so you know that I, I, if if you follow sort of ai um the you know it, it takes it might take six months to train one of the large language models. Um, in in our world, uh, training has to happen much much faster. So um, and a, a recent example I can think of is um, we saw uh, probably three weeks or so ago uh, in several of our markets on Sundays uh, the the demand from drivers changed significantly. And um, you know if it, anyone that sort of lives in this world knows that that's because uh, the NFL season started. And so there were fewer gig economy drivers that want to drive routes while their home team is playing in their home city. And so we need to be able to train models. You know, we can't take four months to train a model and let it run. Ideally, that model is training uh, daily or weekly at least uh, so that we're accounting for like new trends that are happening in the market and actual supply and demand that happens as an example there. Uh, and then inference is what happens, should happen instantaneously um, as you know, we're, we're making a determination from a model uh, and the last thing again is just that training requires data, and so for you know for um, some companies like ours, we have a, you know a databases of huge amounts of data that run all of our systems. If you don't have that, then you know you, we see that legacy companies might need to create uh, me mechanisms to start collecting this data before they can start using it. So how legacy carriers are using AI. These are a few things, and, uh, and, and and a good bit of this is from a uh, uh, supply chain dive article, a friend of ours, um, that uh, collected a lot of info for a bunch of companies. So what we're seeing, especially from FedEx and UPS here, is first is optimizing pricing. So uh, just how much volume can you win? Can you you know learn you know if you put a price out there to the market and it won this week, can we lower it a little bit and win more next week? Uh, the second is rewriting freight volume to account for extreme weather events. This is an awesome one. Um, it, we haven't started doing this at Viho yet. We're, we're not quite at the scale where uh, it makes sense for us to do this, I think, beyond our sort of manual team. But for a network the size of a FedEx or UPS, um, you know, being able to see upstream issues that are starting to happen and change decisions that you're making downstream make a ton of sense. Uh, predicting delivery windows based on driver route progress and traffic conditions is a great one. You can sort of consume telemetry data from your drivers and then you know, change what you're sending to your customers or what's showing up on a tracking page. 
automated customer service responses. I think this is probably the one, the, the first major way that every enterprise is getting some economic benefit from from AI. And so we see uh, the legacy carriers are, are, you know, trying to get rid of their overseas support uh, and, and replace it with AI where possible. Again, I think, you know, Viho and every business is looking for savings in this way. Uh, and then rerouting a, a thing specifically called that, I think this was UPS, was rerouting packages from high theft areas to centralized pickup locations um, to, you know, increase the likelihood that uh, the customer might end up with the package potentially um, at, at the expense of the customer experience there. I'll go into a little more detail on Viho. And, and again, I'm using Viho as an example because I uh, am just intimately involved with the technology there. But we're, we're definitely seeing this from the technology-based carriers. Um, and the technology first carriers. And so um, again, you know, these are sort of the, this is the path dependence that we went through. And there's four things that come out of that. And I'll talk about these four things and provide a few examples. So the first is um, optimize price and cost at every step of the process. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned dynamic rating for shippers. So seeing, you know, if we're winning a lot at this, uh, you know, in this weight range at this zone, uh, keep that or maybe like add a penny to the price. If we're losing this zone every day, then you know try to lower the price a bit and see what we can start winning there. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of carriers doing this. We're also seeing a lot of the shipping platforms that we work with um, that are assisting carriers in doing this. So this is something I think that's going to be, you know, I think every retailer is going to be doing this either themselves or uh, or through, you know, a Shippo or an Easy Post or those type of platforms uh, going forward. A lever that we have, though, uh, I mentioned, you know, the Super Bowl example is uh, pricing of flexible routes. So, you know, those routes that go out on Sundays or the ones that go out on Mondays when we have a lot of routes relative to the number of drivers we have or on Tuesdays in that market where we have fewer routes, we change the rates on those routes. And, you know, if we if, if there are drivers that are you know willing to do a route, um, at you know at twenty two dollars sort of effective hourly rate versus a twenty five dollar uh, effective hourly rate, um, then we're we're constantly discovering that, and so our system is you know making offers to drivers based on past data uh, and, and a ton of other sort of parameters of those routes uh, and is and is pricing those routes appropriately. We didn't invent this. I think probably Uber was one of the early people doing this um, with the ride share share platform, but you know in in a gig economy marketplace, this is a pretty pretty uh, tried and true method for um, discovering the, the right price for a route. The next is just giving drivers the best data. Um, so language translation, this is a, a, a pretty straightforward one, and there's a lot of uh, APIs out there that, that let, um, let you do really, really high quality uh, language translation using AI, AI today. The thing I would highlight up for this for a lot of the newer models and especially the gig economy models is there are, you know, we, we have definitely a lot of drivers on our platform that don't speak any English whatsoever uh, and are able to not, not just use our app based on language, but, real, but, you know, communicate directly with the customer, read customer translated instructions, read instructions from apartment complexes, fully parse out all of the same information that an English speaking driver would need uh, in order to do a delivery. And on the flip side, um, you know, customers, I mean, um, America's, uh, you know, uh, um, has, has people from every country, right? Um, customers, uh, the same, speak different languages, provide their instructions in different languages, and that, that gets immediately translated. So I do, you know, this, this I, I don't want to gloss over this as a, as a small thing. For Viho, it significantly increases the supply available to us, and importantly, lets a broad set of, of drivers be as successful as a native English speaking driver at providing that incredible customer experience. A more unique one is potentially uh, doing telemetry post-processing. So our drivers use our app for every delivery. And as they're doing that, we are collecting, you know, when they're driving on a public street, when they leave a public street, when they transition from driving to not driving, uh, when they, you know, uh, it's, Go, go from sort of not driving to walking, which means they probably had to find the right package in their vehicle, start walking, and then where they leave the package. And what we do with this is we, we do post-processing on that data. And you know, as a fast-growing company, there are many, many addresses that we deliver to for the very first time. The second time that we deliver to that address, we have, you know, using a set of AI tooling, 
um, generated a, a, a number of data points that we can provide to the second driver that's going to be showing up at that location that will make sure that they uh, that they they can get to the right place. And so if you know if if this is the on the the left here, if this is what the driver did, and the driver uh, the customer received the package, especially if they gave it a five star rating. Then the second time around, we try to give that same information to the next driver, even if it's not the same driver, to let them be successful as well. Third thing is simulating every business decision. Uh, a, a couple examples that we're seeing uh, here, and, and we're doing this, and we're seeing a few other companies do this. Um, part of having a flexible operating model, and especially a gig economy operating model, is that we don't always launch all the routes from the same building in the same market every day. Uh, sometimes we do nimble launches, and we'll do we'll do launches from a partner. Or we'll send a driver to, um, you know, a, a, a facility that we don't operate in some cases, um, and you know they're going there to collect 30 packages and then go out and do a delivery. And so, uh, what you see here, this is the Florida coastline uh, from Fort Lauderdale down through Miami, and we cover this entire area. On some days of the week, if you've got a huge number of, of routes, you might want to have three different launch locations. Uh, within that, and you, we can you know fill three box trucks and launch from three locations. If we have a small number of routes and we're not going to fill those, then we might only have one launch location. So simulating this, um, and then all of the permutations of how uh, the economics of this could work for with different launch locations in in different areas, um, is is uh, a use case that we're seeing. Another, uh, again, back to um, the use case of just assigning uh, a dollar value to the, the routes that we're putting out there. Uh, we recently launched a couple new markets. We launched uh, Richmond, Virginia about a week ago. And in Richmond, we have no data whatsoever. We've never done delivery in Richmond. Uh, we don't know what the, the, the driver pool is like there, what the market clearing rates are. So uh, we have a simulation platform where we uh, we collect third-party data on gig economy models in that area. We know how many drivers we expect to be looking at the platform. Uh, we know how many routes we expect to have available. We know the rough sort of length of those routes, the geography, where our pickup location is. And we have a simulation platform that helps us inform what the initial offering should be in those. Um, and so we use this for new markets, but this is also valuable, you can imagine, for, you know, as we look at, like, other events, weather events, uh, sporting events, or festival weeks um, in, in different places. The Boston Marathon is like a huge nightmare to, to handle deliveries around um, with, with traffic and, and availability of drivers. Um, so we use this tool to help inform us for what the starting rate should be on those. The last thing I'll talk about is just reviewing results. Uh, so at, you know, at the end of each delivery, this is, uh, we, we haven't put this, uh, this isn't fully in production. Again, there's, there's a cost element to doing this just for millions of deliveries. Uh, but you know, looking at the the photo proof of delivery, looking at the instructions that the customer left, and uh, using a large language model that can process uh, you know both a, a photograph and a set of text and giving it a good prompt, you can get a pretty good rating of did the driver follow the instructions. Um, or not that the customer provided there, what do we expect that the customer's rating is going to be uh, based on what happened here. The last one I'll talk about is uh, is a, a simulation platform that we use to see just how well we could have done. Um, so this site is uh, a, one of our top line metrics that we look at as a business is uh, packages per hour or stops per hour that our drivers do. If, if our drivers can do 20 stops in an hour, uh, that's great. If they're doing three stops in an hour, we definitely lost money or someone did there. Um, and there are all kinds of things that happen that create inefficiency in that process. There, there's what we call the perfect uh, stops per hour, and then there's what actually happened on that day. And so we have a system that at the end of every day uh, re-simulates every single market and looks at, okay, if, if the truck, you know, if there was a middle mile truck that wasn't late, or if we had better data on geocodes or something that we learned by the end of the day, um, or, you know, we got, I don't know, there's cases where we get packages from clients that were not on the manifest or that sort of thing. What, how could we have performed? Uh, and so this is a top KPI that we look at as a business uh, and are, are constantly sort of root causing this to see how we can perform better. So again, uh, machine learning platform that um, runs these uh, these simulations at the end of the day. So to wrap here, uh, I think the the first takeaway I w would love everyone to have here is first just 
AI and machine learning, you know, doing like large matrix math um, is already having an impact on our industry. I, I think every player either directly or through vendors that they operate is, is, is doing this in some implementation. The second is that I think nearly every um, carrier can be doing this. Um, and and our you know our expectation is that industry wide, you know AI and machine learning has the capability to drive efficiencies and to drive an improved customer experience. And I, I think you'll see this from all the regional carriers, uh, you'll see this from the national carriers, and you'll see this from the tech forward carriers. The third uh, and the, this you know I, I'm probably this is probably a little self serving uh, and, and a bit of a a, a prediction, but. I think that the digitally native shipping platforms over the next couple of years are that there's going to be a substantial gap in cost and quality between the native shipping platforms and the legacy carriers. And, and hopefully you saw through some of the examples that I laid out here, you know, for in we, we see this with our business that I mean, we are we've got years of development still to to create new efficiencies in our business um, and, and new levers to drive down cost. Uh, and, and create higher quality experiences, fewer defects, few, you know, less restitution that we have to pay out when we screw something up. All those things, there's a huge amount of that that we can do with AI. And then we see with the legacy carriers that don't have flexible operating models and don't necessarily have the levers to be able to, to exercise those type of things, um, you know their their costs are are going to continue probably in the direction that they've been going for the last few years. So, I'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully that was interesting. And yeah, now we've we, got some time for some um, Q and A. I'm, well, first I'm a little disappointed when you said you were going to wrap it up. I was hoping for some better beats and such or a wrap. <laughs> but no, do we have any questions from this audience here? Any questions at all? We do have one. I'm going to run over to you awkwardly, fall down the stairs. I'm fine. I didn't get hurt. Don't worry. I'm still alive. I'm going to figure out how to navigate in here to get this. No, I can't. You're taking my job. Look at this. Look how much more fun it is with a wiggle. I'll do it for $3 instead of 20 No, it'll be $2. <laughs> Are you ready for the question? Yeah. I was looking at your capacity map, and I see the little red dot. So does that mean you don't have locations available throughout the US? It's only in certain areas? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, that's correct. So uh, our, our operating model, uh, we essentially launched as a regional carrier. Um, so, you know, there, there are, um, I don't know how many, there's probably uh, eight or 10 regional carriers in the United States that cover, you know, there are some that cover sort of the New York area or just the Boston area or just Texas or, just the West Coast. There are some that, that cover multiple regions, but you know, on on, our, on day one, uh, I mean, it was literally my business partner and I um, with no money, and uh, and you know, this as a concept, and so we, it was sort of impossible for us to you know to be everywhere on day one, and so we we saw a, a go to market approach where we could launch. Uh, this is actually, I mean, we started with some of these meal kit delivery companies because we saw that you know they could send. Uh, a, a single refrigerated dry van into a single city, one day a week, 1,500 packages. We could get a few crowdsourced drivers, do those deliveries that one day, probably roughly break even on that many packages one day a week, and then grow the business from there. And that's that's what we did. So because of that, yeah, we're in 44 markets today. Uh, we, we cover mostly uh, the dense metro areas within the regions that we're in. Uh, we are adding more markets every every um, you know every month or so. We're we're, we're expanding uh, to more zip codes. Our goal is to become a national carrier over the next two to three years and and meaningfully challenge FedEx and UPS. We do believe that that's that's the opportunity that we have here, and that Viho uh, will be a national carrier that will challenge uh, you know have 100% coverage in the United States and challenge all those companies. But we do not today, and so we work mostly with enterprise companies in those dense metros. Wow, that was a good, all right. We got another question over here. Fortunately, I could lean across awkwardly to get that question. Thank you. Um, I have two questions that are interrelated. What are you doing as far as vetting, background checking drivers? And have you thought about getting into more of the high value uh, courier model of delivering like service parts? Yes. Um, 
Yeah, on the supply side, so for drivers, uh, we do a background check on every driver. Um, so it takes you know a day or two for um, once someone applies to be a driver for us to receive that back, um, and and we pay for that. And then once that's done, they they have access to the platform. Um, so we we run an industry standard check there, and um, you know have worked closely with our insurers and everybody to um, make sure that uh, you know we have a well vetted driver pool. I think that's super important for trust and safety generally. Um, on uh, the, more of a courier model, everything that we do today is consolidated delivery. We don't do anything that is sort of point to point. Um, so, you know, our goal is to give a driver 20, 30, 50, 60 packages on a three, four, five, six hour route uh, that's pretty dense. Um, and, uh, and I mean, that's, we've been just like super, super focused on that. We have a lot of high-end clients we do a lot in you know in beauty and luxury apparel um which we're, we're you know we're pretty successful at i think because of the customer centric uh, model that we have but all of that is still consolidated delivery if that's helpful i think that was helpful do we have another question oh come on now it's getting suddenly so popular front row um, just be really quick i suppose drivers pick up from a central location so just curious how you optimize driver routes. You mentioned you wanted them to deliver anywhere from 30 to 40 packages. So how does that work in sprawling metros like L.A. or other high traffic areas? Yeah, uh, we have a bunch of I mean, we, we have our own internal tech stack for taking, you know, a, a 10,000 package day or something and uh, and then clustering those packages and then combining clusters into routes and then matching those routes with drivers. Uh, there's there's a, actually like a it's a pretty hard technical problem to, you know, offer routes to drivers at 6 p.m. tonight when people are still purchasing stuff that we will be delivering tomorrow that we have not yet even received. Uh, and then, you know, get that clustered and then, you know, get that, you know, it routed and, in, you know, built into efficient routes. Um, so there's a, a bunch of technology that goes into that. Um, so yeah, is that is that helpful? I don't know. Bunch of technology is probably not a it was fulfilling answer. Mostly <laughs> helpful. It was not a full on helpful, but she gave me like an eh. Do we have another question that you could do better? Really? Do we have another another question? Because I, I, I okay, I'm gonna make it fair and then I'm coming back to you, my backup plan, right? That didn't sound so encouraging. I'm sorry, backup plan wasn't encouraging. Who was the question over here? All right. Hi, thank you very much, Fred. Uh, there's so much data that exists and there are so many platforms that as logistics providers, we are utilizing, and everybody's trying to use AI to make better decisions. But the challenge we come across a lot of the times is that you have a bunch of data, it's not well structured, it's not well organized, and it becomes, re everybody gets really excited, but then the end product is not as exciting as we thought it would be. What are the lessons you've learned on how you organize and scrub and clean that data to really have the AI help you make better decisions? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, it's very long, of course it had to be good. I liked it. Yeah. The answer that we have there is that it, it just takes a lot of time and effort to do that is the short of it. So we, you know, when it, it, when we're looking at, you know, on, on our technology teams, you know, we're looking at building a feature and we say, okay, it's going to take, you know, two engineers, two sprint cycles uh, to, to build this feature. We just do the same thing with data. So we say, okay, we've got this pile of data in a database we want to turn that into something that is scrubbed and meaningful that we can put into a machine learning platform to make decisions. And so we can't have a bunch of, you know, bad data in there. We can't have a bunch of canceled routes or whatever. Somebody has to go through and do that. So we just treat that, we treat that the same way, right? And we say that, you know, we have data engineers on our team, we have uh, business analytics folks that, um, you know, do SQL. So, you know, like write scrubbed queries to, to clean all that data. Um, and we scope that out and we'll say, okay, that's going to be, it's going to take a couple of, of data analytics folks to sprint cycles to go from this, you know, pile of stuff in a database to something out here. We, we are trying right now to use AI to do this. Uh, we've, we've, I've read some papers on, on folks doing this successfully in enterprise. We have not yet built anything that is doing that today, but I believe it, it seems like that is, you know, t taking an, a set of unstructured data, crafting a, a really good prompt for what you're expecting and what all of, you know, taking like essentially a product requirements document of what all the edge cases are, what you don't want in there and what you do want in there. And then 
uh, giving you know a sample of that data to um, to a large language model. It, we, we believe that that will let us do that better, more mm. efficiently than than we are doing it today. I'd say we haven't proven that yet, and I think a lot of people are trying to figure that out. All right, that was my hum, which meant <laughs> one last question. Now you had a question, but he had a question he never asked it yet. So I'm going to see if it's a great question. Are you ready? ready. All the pressure's on you right now. Do it. I'm sweating. Uh, so you had great success starting in the meal kit, meal kit space, and you've now transitioned to a more generalized e-commerce product. But, you know, I find in logistics, specialization is really important. What do you consider to be the products that you're really good at? Is it still meal kits or is it five to 50 pounds? Is it, you know, sub five pounds? Like where do you, where's your home in this world where you've got infinite competition for one pound and below? Is it two pounds and above? Like, where do you live? Where do you make your, who do you target? Like, if everybody here had that type of volume, who's the customer you want calling on your door? Yeah. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time on this uh, is, is, is part of it. I think, like, our, our core competency is a lot of things that I laid out here, that customer experience, getting it to the doorstep correctly every time, um, and... I, I actually like it, if someone was pitching me our business today, I would have assumed that we would not be great at meal kit because we do have a lot of drivers like in a sedan and, you know, you can't take that many boxes that are this big and fit them in a sedan. Um, and it turns out we are pretty good at that. Uh, we're definitely also good at, at the smaller stuff. I would say operationally, we are getting a crash course in the smaller stuff right now. I think, we, you know, handling poly bags and just how, like, what the cost is to get a poly bag sorted through a facility is way, way different than the meal kit. Different, different, um, yeah, di different sort process all the way through. Um, and we're figuring that out. So I'd say historically, we've been great at like the five pounds and above uh, that the meal kits have fit in. But especially um, all of us in the industry here know that there is a massive amount of turnover going on right now in, in the small package domain, poly bags with the changes USPS is making. Um, and we're finding that we can be very competitive at even that sub one pound uh, package volume. Um, I think, you know, the, we don't have the coverage that a national carrier does. And so we're always sort of at a disadvantage, you know, because you basically have to work with a national carrier also to get stuff to, all the outlying areas and rural and stuff. Um, and so we have to be faster or cheaper or something else on, on, in that domain. Um, but up, up and down the rate card, we are finding that our model is competitive. We like it. Everyone, claps for our, here we go. Fred Cook from Viho. Good job, Thank man. You,